East Africa, you are just in time for your world as we continue to adjust to our new normal. Now, there is a lot to deal with and reconcile for all of us. And this can be a lot tougher for those living with special needs like autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, to name just a few. And of course, other rare diseases. And this also touches on their caregivers. This morning, we get to understand how they are coping in the face of a pandemic. My name is Gladys Gashanja and this is what else you can expect on your world. Over a billion people live with some form of disability with this corresponding to about 15% of the world's population. This today we take a look at how they are coping during this season. We meet Deborah, a caregiver to a child with autism and she narrates her son's journey from birth. We slide to Bosnia where we see harrowing photos from an inside inside an institution of the, those living with disability and to be precise the youth they shed light on the lack of support for special needs kids and their families. <laughs> Clearly that is how a COVID-19 social distancing party would look like. Thank you for joining us on the broadcast. As I had alluded earlier today, we focus on the disruption the COVID-19 has brought to those living with special needs and, of course, their caregivers. And our question of the day, are you or do you know someone who is giving care to a person with special needs that could be Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, autism? And how are they or you coping during this COVID season? Remember, you can reach us on that hashtag, new normal on social media and you can also text in or call in using those numbers at the bottom of your screen with any questions or comments or even sharing your experiences even as we go through the broadcast. Now a look at how the world looks like in as far as the effects of COVID-19 and we look at the numbers and this is coming courtesy of the Nation Media Group's Newsplex and around the world 6,717,847 people have been confirmed to have contracted COVID-19. 3,262,096 people thankfully have recovered from the same. And unfortunately, 393,456 have succumbed to COVID-19. Now, a look at what's happening right here in Kenya and uh, so far 94,507 Kenyans have been tested and 2,600 of them confirmed to have COVID-19. 83 unfortunately have succumbed to COVID-19 and 706 recovered from the same. Now a look at the continent and uh, we will start with our neighbors here in Tanzania and it looks like those numbers have not changed or have not been uh, updated since April but the rest of Africa still looks like it is giving us numbers if I can get to that I seem to be stuck on this one but I'm hoping that I can get those numbers there we go let's see if we can get this oh wow all right I seem to have lost my numbers oh there we go Ethiopia, we have 1,934 confirmed cases 
of COVID-19, 20 people have succumbed to the same and thankfully 281 people have recovered from the same. In Somalia, the cases are up to 2,289 people. Unfortunately, 82 people in that country have succumbed to COVID-19 and 431 recovered cases there. In South Sudan, the situation confirmed cases 994 people death stand at 10 people and recovered cases only at six uganda the cases stand at 707 positive cases of COVID-19. Thankfully, none has succumbed to this condition in that country and 82 people have recovered from the same. In Rwanda, 420 cases confirmed of COVID-19. Two deaths attributed to the same and 282 people have recovered from COVID-19. And in Burundi, the numbers don't seem to be changing much. 63 confirmed, one person has succumbed to COVID-19 and 33 people have recovered from the same. We keep an eye on the world and of course here in the continent even as we take stock of the impact of the pandemic. Now a look at uh, some stories that are headlining locally and county governments have at least 14 days to ensure they have isolation centers with at least 300 bed capacity as directed by the president. This as a country prepares to forestall a possible scramble for beds in a worst case scenario with the numbers expected to surge towards a peak. But with about 10,000 beds short, will counties be ready or on time, while well, Eunice Omolo walks us this talk. With coronavirus cases projected to peak this month and next, the country's hospitals are preparing for a worst case scenario and perhaps avoid making the tough choices between who gets life saving treatment and who doesn't. Siaya County has only a 10 bed isolation facility. In Siaya, this news that the county was ill-prepared for a possible surge of patients sparked a wave of concern. If this surge of COVID-19 it lands, it lands in Siaya, we're wondering where other patients will be occupied or rather where other patients will, will be treated. The county reported one additional case today, meaning all of the county's isolation beds are full. The president directed in February that an isolation center be put up at Nairobi's Bagathi Hospital as one of the preparation measures. The facility has a 120-bed capacity. The order also mandated counties to have fully equipped isolation units at all level 4 and level 5 hospitals in the country. But a number of the counties are yet to comply, even though 36 counties have so far reported infections. We can convert institutions in the counties to be isolation centers. This, I think, should be taken very seriously. And I think the larger the population in a county, the larger should be the bed capacity. The health CS says all the 47 counties should, within 14 days, ensure they have set aside isolation centers with at least a 300-bed capacity to manage a possible flood of patients. That's an estimated 14,100 isolation beds around the country. This is a minimum. There are those counties who have already got a higher capacity uh, than this, Mombasa uh, being an example. The government has disbursed 5 billion Kenya shillings to the counties to increase their capacity to cope. That we use a local Juakali produced beds. That way, we create a lot of opportunities and we create a lot of jobs. I have seen, I mean, for instance, when I visited Machakos County, I saw that uh, their field hospital is filled with beds that have been made by the Juakali sector. The president is expected to meet the Council of Governors to discuss, among other things, their preparedness as the disease is yet to peak. Eunice Omolo, NTV, Nairobi. And as part of those preparations for the worst, the government hopes that home-based care will help ease the burden on already stretched public hospitals. Today, the Ministry of Health outlines the guidelines for home-based care. So how will it work and who qualifies? Ngena Kirori has more. 
With the bull wave of coronavirus infection still to come, the country is still trying to prepare for a flood of critically ill patients who could strain the healthcare systems like nothing we've ever seen before. That not every Care of patients at home is expected to ease the burden on hospitals already stretched to capacity. We are now better informed about our individual responsibility in this campaign. And I would like here to thank those in New Bakumis. The Ministry of Health is developing protocols on how such patients can be minded at home based on the guidelines issued by the World Health Organization. Apart from presenting a COVID-19 positive report from the laboratories, a patient must be asymptomatic or have a mild form of the disease based on the triage from a doctor. They must not have a pre-existing condition such as high blood pressure, diabetes or chronic chest pain or chronic kidney problems. In addition, one must have adequate space in the room they choose for home-based care, which is separate from the rest of the house and is well ventilated. Attention to the prevention control guidelines must be prioritized. Washing hands, use of sanitizers and wearing of masks and gloves are mandatory. Only the caregiver and the patient can access this room and they must wear protective equipment. In case the patient's situation deteriorates, there must be an identified healthcare center that they can call in case of an emergency. And lastly, We must have adequate space, preferably a separate room from the rest of the household members where you'll be able to stay during this place, during this uh, isolation or quarantine. Following the World Health Organization's guidelines on home-based care, the government is now set to enroll 57,000 community health workers through a two-week training online module. But in a country where the differences in social status draw huge parallels, not everybody will have access to home-based care. If you don't meet some of these preconditions, then it means you can only go for institutional-based isolation or quarantine. As has been the norm, a COVID-19 patient would stay in isolation for 14 days and be tested thereafter. But WHO has reviewed guidelines and data and found that after the 10th day, even if secretions of the virus are found, those are likely to be breakdown products of the virus that are likely not infectious. This is just part and parcel of the evolving research being found in the new phenomena that is the coronavirus. Gena Kirori, NTV. And in line with our core conversation of the day, we meet Deborah Ateno, a mother to a son leaving with autism. Now she narrates her son's journey from birth and she paints a picture of being a caregiver to a special needs child. It has not been easy, but she counts it all joy to have a child as a blessing, a child who keeps improving day after day. Take a look. During pregnancy, everything was okay. In fact, my never felt any difficulties like headache, the vomiting, they were not there up to the day that he went to deliver. So it was like four centimeters the whole day, in fact two days. When I was in the waiting room now to enter the theater, then the baby's head came out. So they were like, we cannot rush him in for the, her, her in for theater because your kichwa imanza kutoke there. When the baby came out, he never cried. When he was in the nursery, the second day, he convulsed. From there, Akawekwa on drugs, the um, anti-convulsive drugs plus some antibiotics. I used to go for the review like twice per month. Later, it was once per month for up to five years. But when he was three years, I stopped the drugs because once, one, it was, it was very expensive. At three years, he could not sit still properly. The head, ukimbeba, kichwili kwe nanguka uko. So you could not even carry him on your back. Unambeba kama mtuto wa like a month. The legs were still weak. Everything was just weak on him. Actually, the dad was so supportive. Tulikuwa tunanayak, tunaona what the doctor anafanya. Tukifika nyumbani, tasisi tunafanya. Later on, he advised us kumpeleka shule at least apate iyo kampani ya watoto wengine because alikuwa rough angeza ataka other head teachers wanabali kuwa rough wanakuongelesha is like kwa hii shuli yetu watutaki abnormal kids so from there ndio nikampeleka SK St. Monica in Utawala for the time ameona yu uyo speech therapist kumekuwa na improvement because he can count 1 to 10 
anaita mam maji nataka kususu nataka kupupu so many ng request sijui kama ni the government ama the doctors wangekuja na a cheaper way of maintaining these kids ikuwe kama hao ni wako na ARV imekuwa sama affordable hata hiyo nini hii dawa za convulsions ikuwe affordable Deborah there narrating her story in as far as being a caregiver to a child with autism. And that sets a good, good note for us to start off our conversation th this morning, even as we look at the effects of COVID-19 on those living with special needs and their caregivers. And to help us have this conversation, I'm joined by Dr. Pauline Samia, who is a pediatric neurologist from the Aga Khan University Hospital, and also joined by Sylvia Mora, who is a founder and specialist speaks and also uh, with a child, two boys actually, who have autism and Lili Mogane who is the founding secretary T21 support group and also is a caregiver to a son with Down syndrome. Ladies, thank you for joining me this morning and uh, Dr. Ari, I'll start with you. Maybe you can break down for us what exactly neurological conditions are. Well, um, thank you for having me this morning. Um, Neurology conditions are very broad. Uh, you've mentioned some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be grouped into very many way, in various ways. And one of the ways we look at them is, were you born with this problem or is it something that you acquired? If you are born with that problem, you could end up with a clinical presentation of, um, uh, you know, um, of delayed development. Uh, and it, the cause of that delayed development could be varied. Uh, you may present with autism spectrum disorder, you may have cerebral palsy, you may have epilepsy, and of course you've also talked about uh, things like uh, Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, some other children, they are um, outwardly, they are perfectly fine, it's just that f for them learning is a problem, mm -hmm. understanding things is an issue. They do not have anything else that causes an emergency, but they just find it difficult first and foremost to understand their environment and to manipulate that and to learn. Then we have other problems that come along as a child interacts with the environment. This is a lot to do with, for example, vaccine preventable illnesses. Like you can get uh, missiles today, mm -hmm. you end up with the, <coughs> like what we call an encephalitis and you know, a swelling of the brain and that goes away. And then later on, you find that uh, this child has now deteriorated, is having seizures, and we don't even have treatment for that. Other things, of course, as you know, there can be meningitis, uh, effects of malaria on the brain, effects of TB on the brain. And then, of course, we have um, accidents. We have uh, quite a number of children now involved in accidents uh, which um, uh, result from motor vehicle in the, uh, the motor vehicles mm -hmm. or even border borders, the use of border border. So trauma is another thing that really, really contributes significantly. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, as Deborah has mentioned, um, Difficulties at delivery, uh -huh. yeah, which is something we'll probably talk about later in the show. We're worried at this point in time that um, a lot of moms who are carrying otherwise healthy pregnancies, if they fail to go to hospital, then this bit where we already know is significant, if they're not well attended to during labor, then we could end up with many other problems. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Sylvia Morai, you've been walking this walk for a long time. Two sons with uh, autism. And um, how has that journey been? When did you find out, first of all, that uh, your children had the autism spectrum disorder? Uh, thank you, Gladys, for that. Uh, for my son, my second son, that's, let's call him baby A, I found out when he was around three months when he started getting seizures. So the seizures prevent, presented themselves first, and but the first doctor I reached out to uh, just said it was go, it was a behavior that might go away, and then in time it got worse, and then that you started noticing he's not walking in time, he's not catching up with his uh, according to his age with his, his milestones. And when we went for evaluation, uh, that's when now we got to be told that he has autism, apart from now the convulsive disorder. Uh, for Andrew, when we were having uh, him assessed, we also had Bradley checked out because the doctor noted and he was like, there's something not right. 
but the challenge of having one child and then you're being told probability of your other child also could be on the autism spectrum was so devastating that I took a long time to embrace that and accept. So that means I delayed his intervention mm -hmm. uh, and also the other family and environmental aspects of it made it a bit difficult because I was still going through a divorce at the same time. But uh, I did, uh, they evaluated, they told me, I didn't act on it, I, got, I evaluated again and then it was about time now to just embrace it because he wasn't speaking. I was telling myself that it was because of the association of his elder brother because they are almost age mates and they were spending a lot of time together. But then when it comes to going to school and you realize that um, he's supposed to be in a class of seven year olds, but he's being put in a class of three and four year olds, that was the wake up call. So oh. I had to now just embrace it and start uh, with early intervention. Sylvia, you have two boys with autism. Do you have any other family member with a special needs disorder? Um, my firstborn is okay. My sister has a child with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the only one that I, we have. Because most of the time once you're told that there is uh, this issue of autism, you're always told to look down your family line but by the time I was having mine, no one actually had an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so that time you also check on your husband's side at the time and you discuss. So you have to go down your family tree and try and find out. But it's a bit challenging because you find autism is not something that has been very common. So many might be having, living with it, but not even aware of it. Okay. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. Dr. Ari, clearly the genetics here have a part to play. Is it possible, as you alluded to earlier, to actually uh, to have other factors playing into having autism? Oh yes, yeah. It's uh, genetics carries the most important uh, part, uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, this child may have a genetic change in themselves, such that they are the first person in that family. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily inherited. Genetic is not necessarily inherited. It just means the constitutional makeup of that person is different from that of other people. Mm -hmm. So that uh, there are no other members of the family that have been found to have this, it is possible. When you have two, yes, most likely then there is some inheritance involved. Okay, yeah. now boys are about four times, I read, more likely to develop autism than girls. Explain that. Oh, that's being challenged at this point mm -hmm. uh, from a research point of view. What happens is, yes, uh, uh, most of the people who have severe autism, they tend to be boys uh, and therefore they're picked up easily. Uh, right now there are people in, um, especially so the high income countries who are female and are receiving their diagnosis when they're much, much older. So girls sort of pick up on social cues faster. They could still be on the spectrum, but they learn how to adapt. So we're beginning to challenge that narrative that uh, we have four to one, which is what we publish. Um, it's probably thought to be something closer to two is to one. Two boys for every one girl. Uh -huh. Yeah, so okay. knowledge does evolve. All right. Yeah. Now, Lily Mogane, you have a boy who has Down syndrome. When was this diagnosis made for you? Hello. Yeah, um, my boy is called Mugane, uh, Munene Mugane. He's five years old. And yes, he was that he was diagnosed. Uh, we actually came to know about his condition for Down syndrome when he was three months. We knew about him at birth because um, the pediatrician told us at that point she was not sure whether he had he didn't have the full markers for Down syndrome. Um, but by three months, when we were going during the regular clinic visits, we questioned and asked, why is he so floppy? He felt more like a pillow. And the, and the doctor asked us, so are you suspecting anything? And we're like, no, we don't know anything. Is there something we should be worried about? And that's when she recommended that we should do the karyotyping test with the blood work. And yeah, it came out positive after two weeks, uh, three weeks actually, because the test 
had to be sent out of the country. And yeah, we were told he has Down syndrome. Initially, we didn't know what that means because I've never even experienced, I had not seen any child with Down syndrome. It never came across to me like uh, uh, an issue. But yeah, so when we got the results, the doctor was very devastated. She actually cried. Maybe she was mourning the child that she thought she would be uh, taking care of. She's been our pediatrician. Even we have two other children. Uh, so she's been our pediatrician all along. And yeah, that's when it hit us. We were like, OK, so what's all this about? And yeah, it's been quite a journey. Uh, since then, I've met other parents. Uh, that's how the T21 Family Support Organization came up. Uh, we currently are around 180 families represented in the organization. And it's been quite something, uh, just supporting each other, seeing people go through therapy. We have to do therapy. That is very key for our children to thrive. When we were diagnosed, we were told we have to do three therapies in a week, uh, looking at that being employed. And now you have to put in hours to make sure that your child get these therapies. We had to get someone to come home. That is not cheap. Very few people can afford that. Uh, yeah, and each therapy was costing us around 1,500, so that is 4,500 per week. Wow. And we did this continuously for two years, because two, he started working at two years, three months. So at least that was, uh, we were given some clearance. We can now relax a bit on that. Occupational therapy is continuous, though. And then there is speech therapy. So after con after uh, being cleared on occupational, there is speech therapy, which we had to take up two times a week. This speech therapy, again, is very expensive. There are very few uh, therapies, uh, certified speech therapists out there. So currently, we are paying around 2500 per session. If you go for two times a week, 37000 yeah. and it is continuous, it's five years. So sometimes I look at it and I wonder how other parents survive on such, considering insurance, most of the time insurance does not cover this cost. Okay. Now, those are pertinent issues, definitely, that will be coming up even as we talk about this. Just a quick one, Lily. Anyone else with uh, a condition similar to what your child has or something else? No, there is actually I, I no family member who has a similar condition. Even considering this is a chromosomal issue, yeah. there are some that is, it, uh, these are parts that is hereditary, mm -hmm. which is only covers, which covers around 3% of the, of the children. So it's rare, but it can happen. But I don't have any family member who has the same condition. Okay, now, Dr. Tari, break down the biology now, the science in it. T21, apparently it's, the, it's some defect with the, that chromosome. Explain that to us. Yes, there are many ways um, uh, somebody can get uh, Down syndrome, but the most common is where when the fetus, or rather, yeah, when the fetus is being formed, mm -hmm. or what we call the embryo, there's a process where you get, uh, you inherit um, material or genetic material from your mother and some other material from your mother, from your father. Mm -hmm. So when those come together, you can only have a certain number. So you're supposed to have 46 chromosomes, but uh, with T, with the T21, most, a lot of times, number 21 fails to sort of um, separate. Mm -hmm. So instead of inheriting one copy, say, from your mother, you end up inheriting two copies from, you know, from your mother mm -hmm. and one from your father, so you end up with three of them. Occasionally, you also have breakages in the chromosomal material, mm -hmm. and so a piece of the T21 can also break and join itself onto the current one so that you end up with uh, two of them but with extra material. Mm -hmm. So you find that um, it seems to be like a more fragile chromosome than the rest. So the, those are usually the most common ways in which you can inherit that. And actually, yes, uh, Lily is uh, correct. Um, finding it uh, recurring in a family 
is rare. It oh. probably speaks to um, a more complicated form of uh, inheritance. Mm -hmm. But the other one where you're likely to be the only person within a family is the one that's more common. And let's touch a bit on the risk factors. I was reading up and they say advancing maternal age could be one of them. Like if you have your babies when you're too Even when old. you're too young. If you're 15 and 16 and 17, we, uh -huh. we actually find a larger number mm -hmm. uh, of uh, younger mothers having children with uh, Down syndrome partly because the other ones having more children. So yes, it's true, age is a risk factor, yeah. but it doesn't mean that the fact that you're 18 or 19, you cannot get a child with Down syndrome. You still can. All right, yeah. and now that we're talking about risk factors, mm -hmm. ingestion of alcohol, smoking, um, do this pay, play a part? It's always best not to smoke or take alcohol, uh, mm -hmm. especially so if you're planning a pregnancy. Uh, of course, many pregnancies are not planned. Yeah. Um, they're not very strong risk factors. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's about what is the, especially so the mother's own genetic makeup. Yeah. yeah, we have had situations where we think this is Down syndrome, it presents like Down syndrome. When you go ahead and do the genetics, you find that the family actually carries a different kind of genetic aberration or change. And the risk then sometimes is that this same change can then be inherited by other children. So um, karyotyping as well as other uh, more advanced uh, techniques that are now al al available to us, mm -hmm. like uh, microarray, uh, whole exome sequencing, genomic sequencing. And all, all those, these are what? They're available, all those things are tests uh -huh. where instead of just looking at the external structure of the chromosome, mm -hmm. you're able to go chromosome by chromosome, bit by bit, uh -huh. to identify where the breaks are and exactly what is missing or what has been added, uh -huh. yeah, what has been duplicated. So our science has moved on with time. Okay, and yeah. getting better with time. Yes, it is certainly getting better. All right, now we're now joined by Kamoyo Karongo, who actually is a cerebral palsy advocate. He has been living with CP, and his story is very, very amazing. Karongo, if you can hear me, when did Mama know that her baby had cerebral palsy? Okay. When I was born, I, I did not cry. Then I cried after these days. Okay, and at this point, when they diagnosed you with cerebral palsy, what did Mama say? What did she tell you? What was her reaction? She took it in a nice way and decided to move on and I've done a lot of therapy for me to reach the way I am today. Do you have siblings, Karongo? Yes, I have an elder sister and a younger sister. Are you the only one with cerebral palsy in your family? Yes, I am the only one. And what is your, how does your support system look like? Who do you live with? I live with my my mom. Okay, and I understand that you actually work for the Communications Authority, right? Yes. And that means you are able to go through your schooling right from primary to university? Yes. How was that experience for you, Karungu? I started in special school called Joy Town from special class up to class seven. And then I will change to 
Akarao disabled children's home from class 7 to class 8. Mm-hmm. Where well, I did my case certificate of primary education. And where did you go to high school? I for high school I, I went to Castromina School and I was a this caller. Okay, and you made it, did well and went to university, right? Yes. Which one? I went to digital and virtually and running center which is now Gates, Africa. Oh, well done. How was uh, the experience going to school? Did other children look at you differently? No, I had a uh, one on one with the deck, Shara, and we were typing assignments and projects and submit them online okay. for market. Okay, now you say and you always talk about how your mother was instrumental in empowering you to be the man you are today, right? Yes. She accepted you as you were? Yes, yes she did. And how did she deal with people looking at you being different? It was a matter to deal with people, but we went everywhere together, no matter what other people are talking, we did listen to them. Okay, now Dr. Ari, just listening to Karungu, of course mostly people think about the young children, but it is inspirational to see he has lived a full quality life. Talk about the importance of the right intervention at the right time. Oh, Gladys, yeah, that's very important. You see, when you're born, your brain is quite immature and it undergoes a lot of uh, uh, processes and uh, some of these are completed by age three to four. And so your brain, therefore, is sensitive at that time. You know, you can learn just about anything. A baby is born not knowing any language, but at that point in time, they're capable of learning anything. They can become pianists, they can, you know. But as you grow older, you actually lose those abilities. So it's true. It's the same way with therapies. If you begin to intervene early, the likelihood that you will catch up is better. And uh, his story is exceptional. We tend to see uh, most of our cerebral palsy children very young. So in a way, we are lucky and we are able to talk to families uh, and encourage them to take them for therapies. But as Sylvia had mentioned before, sometimes it's a difficult process for the family because that is not what they were expecting for their child. So for this doctor to now start saying, oh, you know what, we got this problem, you need to do this, you need to do that. I recently saw a girl whom I saw seven years ago said, you know, we have a problem here. You need to go do your investigations. We're doing them now. Okay. Yes. And uh, we talk about a lot of risk factors being uh, attributed to pregnancy. And Karungo said he did not cry. He cried after three days. Mm -hmm. So what about pregnant women should they do to take precaution? 
Well, first and foremost, uh, there is a disclaimer there because not everything is preventable. We've just talked about congenital mm -hmm. problems. We've talked about um, genetic problems. So sometimes there's absolutely nothing wrong with the pregnancy. But to eat healthy, to rest, to avoid stresses especially. If you have hypertension, make sure that that's managed properly. If you know you already carry, for example, a heart problem, make sure that you're seeing your doctor. Mm -hmm. If you have diabetes, make sure that that is being managed appropriately. If you've lost previous pregnancies, it's always very important that you try and get somebody who is qualified to walk the journey with you. Mm -hmm. Then finally, when it comes to the time for delivery, you're the one who knows yourself best. So if you feel there's something not right, your baby is not kicking, he's no longer moving as he should, you just don't feel right, don't stop looking for help until somebody accepts to help you. Because I have seen situations where mom goes to hospital, says, I don't feel right. They do all the investigations for 15, 20 minutes. They reassure her, please go home, come back when you're in established labor. No, I think that uh, people should... Um, yes, listen to doctors, but also if you feel something is not right, please seek the help that you require. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, across the borders, Eleanor is a first candidate with Down syndrome, <clears throat> excuse me, to stand for municipal elections in France after being approached by Irish Mayor Frederic Latik. Now committed to cleanliness and accessibility in her city, Lalox has fought for years for the people with Down syndrome and other disabilities to be able to live happier and more productive lives as fully integrated members of society. Now, Eleanor or the administrative officer and candidate at the municipal elections in Iris says, at the very beginning, I suffered from Down syndrome, but not anymore. I have accepted living with it. I'm autonomous. I have my own apartment. I live like other people. I am well. I reign for mayor. The mayor trusts me because he knows I am determined or I am a determined young woman who loves life. I know what I want. I have a crazy temperament, but happy that... Uh, the editor, Frederick, actually had hope or accepted me as I am. Amazing, amazing story there. And clearly you can see she's full of life. Lily Morgana, you have a son with Down syndrome. What does that story do for you? It's so touching. It feels, it gives hope that I'm looking at it and thinking, wow, when we get there, I think all parents, whether Down syndrome, whether autism, whether cerebral palsy, just need to see something so awesome and yeah, we let people know that there is hope and we will get there. We will get there. We just need to do what we need to do. And we'll try to get in there. Okay. Now, even as we are spreading some hope, maybe you can touch on what are some of the challenges you're facing in the face of COVID-19? Okay. Uh, I must say... Um, um, personally because my employer is very understanding uh, I have fully worked from the house so I have not gone out there because the risk of exposing our children is huge our children are mostly born with a uh, heart condition and their, their immunity is low so I can imagine if I was in a position that I have to work because the financial disruptions are there I have seen mad and other parents just deciding you have to choose. Is it my child or now do I pay rent and buy food? Mm -hmm. And it's a choice. So I have seen many struggling with that. Uh, there, are, there are very many disruptions on therapy. We are not doing any therapy at the moment because you cannot risk taking your child out there to the hospitals for the therapy or even bringing the therapy home. You don't know where they've been and whether they are exposed. Yeah. So therapy has told. That means our children will regret 
So you have to do what you have to do as a parent. Do you become a therapist? Mm -hmm. And if you become a therapist, how about the work? Because like now, personally, I'm supposed to be working. So I become a therapist. When will I do the therapy and at the same time work? And then the medication, accessing medication. Uh, there are some hospitals that are fully like Mbagati. It's fully an isolation center. Yet maybe you had selected Mbagati as your hospital for any IF to access medication. We have seen parents unable to reach the the especially anticonvulsants, the thyroxides that many of our children take, mm -hmm. uh, and also even the rectification for heart con the heart condition. There are many who cannot now travel to have that done. So those are huge challenges that I'm seeing majority of us struggling with. Personally, I'm happy with the progress that Munene is. I can see with him mm -hmm. um, I don't, because the, the siblings are around. So, yeah, the, he has been getting the pitch therapy indirectly from the older siblings. They cannot go to school. They have online learning, but he cannot concentrate for more than even, say, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. That would mean I'm fully teaching with him if I am to enroll him for the online classes. So he has stopped. He's not doing their online classes. And for us, um, priority for school was even the socialization piece. Yeah. So he keeps asking, when am I going to school? When am I seeing teacher? And after some time, even though you try reaching out to the teacher for them to talk, it gets to a point where you're thinking, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I want to see you. We've tried video calls. Yeah. He also gets frustrated. Yeah. And there he's used to a certain routine. Okay. That routine has been disrupted. So it's mm -hmm. important to a point that he melt down, but also more. And mm -hmm. I have to understand that. It's mm -hmm. because he's, there is a change in his life. Yes. But now what does that do to me? What does that do to the siblings? What does that do to the whole family? Yeah. I can't say many are struggling in this situation. And uh, when you look at how even say the government is going around this thing, uh, we have seen the programs that have been put in place mm -hmm. to reach out to the parents. Down syndrome children, if you say put a cerebral palsy, uh, Down syndrome, autism. Many of the autistic children or the people, the children with Down syndrome, they will look like they are typical. Uh, the government says the funds uh, to reach out to the families are for the severely disabled. Yeah. The, how do you know the neurodiverse community is severely disabled or not? It's not physical. So the judgment for that is lacking, and a majority of us have missed on those uh, support uh, funding from the government, mm -hmm. and it's becoming quite something. And seeing that we are going to go through this deal, I don't know when now that there is an extension. We really need to look at how to support each other. And as a, as an organization, we have tried our best. There is a point that we had to even do food donation to our families. We reached out to Rotary Club, we reached out to Kapu Africa, and we got some food that we distributed to our families because the need is there and it is bad. It is, it's really devastating. Yeah. And I hope the only, my, my only call out there would be after all this, our children will also even have, a, they are doing this double take. So they are suffering now. And after that, when we go back to another normal, there will be another disruption. So we will, again, suffer another take. So, yeah. We hear really you. We hear you, Lily. Um, and, of course, this is, you painted a picture that is a reality for many caregivers or patients with uh, special needs. And, uh, Sylvia, even as you uh, represent and speak, what are some of the disruptions? For example, for you, you have two boys and you are stuck in the house because you're afraid of exposing them out there. How did that look like? Uh, thanks. thanks, Gladys, for the question. Uh, at, at first, it was uh, traumatic for me, for the boys, 
because you're trying first to grasp what is going on. Apart from that, now you have to embrace it and try and live with it. Uh, with a child with ADHD, that is my last child. Mm -hmm. That means they are very hyper and uh, they need to move a lot because the electrons in their body is very is excessive. So they really need to get it out and that's how they do it by running around. So the minute the lockdown is introduced, that means he has all this ball of energy that he cannot let out. Of course, that means there was a lot of distraction in the house. There was a lot of meltdowns and then combine that with Andrew who's autistic and lives by routine. He wakes up, there's a specific way everything has to be done throughout the day. So, and you know, all this was very sudden. So there was no time to follow the protocols that we normally do when we're introducing change to him, which is speak to him and let him know, use photos uh, and try and just have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Also remember that um, he's not verbal, he's partially verbal. He does only like three words. Actually, Dr. Samia is our neurologist. So, and we are due for uh, a review. And all of a sudden, you can't do that. Uh, we are looking at our stocks of medication because he, he had just uh, gotten out of a ad hospital from admission. This results to a lot of meltdowns. We are seeing regression in the behaviors that he has. So things we had overcome are now coming back. Mm -hmm. Things like sensory overload. Now he's, he's not having his speech therapy. That means we are seeing a lot of drooling because of, of the exercises that they usually do for his mouth muscles. Mm -hmm. As much as we're trying to have conversation and teach him new terminologies and stuff like that, there are things that I am not qualified to do. Uh, even other parents are going through the same. I have the advantage that I've interacted a lot with the occupational therapist and speech therapist in, in the space that I am in and that Andy speaks. But then when I have to do it, and I have to, looking at that, it's different because Andrew's needs are totally different from what Bradley mm -hmm. needs. And you find Andrew now started getting behaviors like violence. He starts screaming nonstop. He's crying, he's frustrated, he cannot communicate this, image, this emotion of frustration. So you can imagine you are dealing with hyperactivity on one side, then you're dealing with this meltdown, which can last an hour. By the time the day is over, you feel like your head is exploding. Yeah. And apart from that, you still have regular life. I need to provide, I'm a single parent. I ha they have to eat. We, our, community was the first to be affected because I'm a graphic designer and events. So all events were canceled. So you can imagine you're dealing with real life stress and trying to figure out your way, how you move from here moving forward. And you still have to deal with this. And apart from that, then there is the education side of it, as Lily had mentioned, which is now interrupted. There are two different individuals. Andrew, Andrew's learning style is totally different mm -hmm. from Bradley's learning style. And you only have a limited amount of time. And their concentration span is at maximum 10 minutes. And so at the same time, you're trying to get a new routine. So yeah. it's, it's a handful. And how are you coping? That sounds a lot. How are you coping? <laughs> it, is, it is a lot. And first, for the first two weeks, there was, of course, the phase of de depression, trying to realign everything and figure out where you're going to move from here. Mm -hmm. And the sad reality, sometimes you'd like to have a support, but y you find you're the only support you have. Although we have WhatsApp groups, we have Facebook, where we connect as caregivers. But for me, you see, it's different. Like all the things that can go wrong is what has been handed to me. Because being a single parent, Lockdown, no one can come in, no one can go out. So even if I would want to call someone to help me, it's a risk. You have to wait. I don't know where you are. How, and my children don't understand social distancing because they're they extremely social. Mm. So it, it's not been easy. But like for this weekend, for us caregivers, you have to learn how to adjust. So I opted to reschedule, reschedule my my. my program so I try and go to the office just to change environment and align my mind by working two to three times a week and then the other days I'm a therapist I'm a teacher I'm the play partner to the boys yeah. but 
um, at least for this weekend, I sent them over to my mom because I, they need the space. I don't have that much of a space mm -hmm. because you live in an apartment. At least she has bigger space. And I'd rather know, I know my mom understands. I know she, they know what the challenges that are there. So I sent them, them with the elder brother and the nanny. Okay. Then now it's, it's the time now you breathe and reload your energies to be able to deal now further. Wow, wow, yeah. that's intense. I mean, Dr. Sabir, a lot is happening at this time. First, let's start off. Is telemedicine possible for those with special needs? Oh, certainly, yes. We have had the opportunity to help children in, as far as load work. Uh, through telemedicine and uh, what I find quite nice is when I can see my patients and I haven't seen them for a while it's uh, quite exciting I always insist on not just talking to the parent I actually do want to see the child and for the child and I it's actually uh, quite interesting it's, it's actually quite nice um, that we have uh, put this together and reached out to families and said, you know, you really don't have to come to hospital, but yes, we can reach you through a video link. Sometimes it's only telephone that's available, but we're still able to sort out issues mm -hmm. that way. We try and make sure that their medications, wherever it is that they are, even for those outside the country, we've been able to uh, send them their medications. You find a way, you know, to do this. So telemedicine is truly the way that we're now thinking that Going forward, we need to see how to reach even more children. Can you think about children of the pastoralist community, for yes, example? Yes. Yeah, so we are putting structures in place. This is not stopping here. Mm. We really do want to harness this so that that barrier that exists between us, for example, at Aga Khan University Hospital mm -hmm. and the children sitting in Mandera, the children sitting in Moyale, mm -hmm. uh, we're able to reach them without them having to go the distance. But we're talking about therapy being very integral in uh, the management of these conditions. You cannot do this, you know, virtually. Oh. What happens here? <laughs> How do we ensure that our children do not regress? Okay, it's unfortunate. Yes, I have seen some children regress in the, this time uh, during, uh, due to the concerns that parents have. And they're right. You know, nobody wants to do something and then say, oh God, I wish I knew I had, I, I mean, I shouldn't have done this. Um, but having said that, there are ways these things are done. For example, there is a one formal structure that I know called the Ali Denver Start Program. Uh, where the parent is an integral part of the therapy process. The therapists actually teach you how to manage your child during a therapy session and how to continue even outside of the hospital setting. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunate I didn't get an opportunity to come with one of our therapists, but basically one of the things that can be done using telemedicine is for them to show you what to do real uh -huh. time yeah. with the child that you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, and especially so for us, what has been easy is especially so children we already know all right yes. so rather than break off completely yes telemedicine can also be used to uh, break or bridge that gap mm -hmm. either by having another therapist that the family uh, trusts near them mm -hmm. or by even just using the parents parents are a very integral part there's no therapy that goes on without successfully without the involvement of parents yes. when you go for a speech therapy t a session and you will always be given tasks to continue afterwards so that hopefully uh, when you come back, then the child has made progress. Remember, the parent has a lot more time with the child than even the therapist can. Three times a week is a short time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, the parents are an integral part of it. And we really need to find ways to sort of um, either have group sessions to reduce costs for this kind of things yes. or use telemedicine to bridge the gap. We, I think what this pose, you know, occasioned by COVID does mm. is give us an opportunity to rethink exactly how we're delivering care and how we can do this better. But even as we talk about the special needs patients, we have talked about the caregivers being an integral part in taking care of them and their treatment and management. So how are these caregivers taking care of themselves during this time? Mm -hmm. That conversation coming right after this break. Stay with us.
Beautiful pictures there from Tarakaniti. Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanja as we speak about COVID-19 and the effects of the same on those living with special needs and their caregivers. And to have this conversation still with me in studio, Dr. Pauline Samir, who is a pediatric neurologist with the Aga Khan University Hospital. We are also joined by Sylvia Mora, who is a founder of Andy Speak and also a caregiver to two children with special needs. And we are also joined by Lili Mugane, who has a son with Down syndrome. Ladies, thank you for joining me. We shall be joined by two other parents who have children who have rare diseases because these need to be talked about. And of course, we have Karogo Kamoyo, who is living with cerebral palsy and such an inspiration to many. Now, Karogo, I'll start with you. You said you live with your mother, so she is the one who takes care of you? Yes. Is there anyone else who lives with you to help her? Yes, I live with my mom and we are just the two of us in the house. Okay, now when it comes to your day-to-day -day needs in as far as uh, taking care of yourself, are you able to do some of those things on your own? Yes, I can shower myself, I can make my bed, I can feed myself, and I also work. Okay. Work from home. Oh, you work from home right now. Now, before COVID-19, you are able to actually go to the office, right? I was able to go to the, to the office daily. And how do you commute? I have a car and I have a driver. Okay. Now, when you think about how far you've been able to come and the things you've been able to achieve, what would you encourage those living with special needs or caring for those with special needs? What I can say is, even though you have special needs, God has a purpose for, for you. You may feel bad, but you will come up in life and do the best in the world. Okay, and in as far as supporting those with special needs? Support them in every way they can so that they can be able to help themselves in their future life. Okay, and now that you are quarantined at home, has it been difficult to access treatment or medication? Like, for me, like, I have a piece who come uh, every Saturday, mm -hmm. but when COVID-19 was announced to be in Canada, we had to stop the happy, which means 
where the therapist left me when he came, when he came back I would have been gone back a bit so when we started therapy again mm. it will be like us starting from the beginning okay and in this case what would you ask those who are in charge in as far as ensuring that therapy for those for with special needs continues repeat it again what can you urge those who are helping those with special needs in terms of therapy medication what needs to be done to ensure there's no gap now what i can say is you come to see the pa the patient mm -hmm. like even though you would resume your daily duties, mm -hmm. at least see the patient like once a week or two times in two weeks. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Kamoyo Karogo, for speaking to us and being such an encouragement. We wish you good health and, of course, safety during this season. Thank you. All right. Now, Lili Mogane, before we went to break, we talked about the importance of the caregivers getting care themselves. How are you coping with everything happening around you? What's your support system? <laughs> okay, because we have to do what we have to do. Um, I've been lucky to have a supportive husband. So after work, uh, that is at 4, 4.30, sometimes I just go and take a, a drive, a walk, and just be out, out there, even though it's for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, surprisingly, we, are, we have to look for ways to just let out, you know, and what do you call it, get the pressure out. There are times I've, I've realized recently that even something simple like folding clothes has been a good relief to me. <laughs> so with all that going around after the clothes and the laundry has been done, I go and just sit and fold the clothes alone. 30 minutes, 45, and I'm good. But I've realized uh, get reaching out to other people who are in your shoe, who are wearing your shoes. So the support group, we have been posting things just to encourage each other. When you realize you're not alone, there are people even going through worse situation than you. It's mm -hmm. easier to carry the load. So yeah, we've been doing Zoom meetups. So where we just want to find out how are you doing? What are you implementing? So like therapy, we share online material, homeschooling, what can you do that is within you? Maybe it's an app that has helped your child mm -hmm. uh, and we try and implement that. So regular reaching out to even other people who are wearing similar shoes is very helpful. Uh, there are many other support systems, uh, many other groups uh, that I have plugged myself into and I have seen resources coming through and I don't hesitate to call therapists or teachers and tell them I'm seeing this problem, uh, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And most of them have been supportive, saying uh, say it's a therapy, it's a melt, meltdown or is it a sensory issue? Is it about school? What can we do differently like that one of video call with the teacher is the teacher who suggested when Monene couldn't talk, he yeah. didn't want to talk to her. And I realized, oh, so you just wanted to see her face. So yeah, reaching out is very helpful because okay. the meet time that, that you might have, mm -hmm. you might want to have, might also expose you 
to the virus. So, yeah. Okay. Now, That's Sylvia, you have spoken about most of the homes catering for those with special needs are single parent homes. In your case, since that you wear these shoes, how are you keeping your head above water? Um, normally, I go against the grain. So I thrive in helping other people. So for me, this time, after we settled at home first, because that was what was primary, get the kids settled, then I adjusted my schedule. Uh, being, I'm a workaholic with no apologies. <laughs> I think I thrive on that, on that high of, I, I can do something. So I go to work and then come home. I spend some time with the boys, be silly a bit. You know, those things you never get to do, like dance with them, sit on the floor. Like when was the last time you were like a baby? Or we go to the rooftop, I, I, I laugh off. I, I'm training them, but at the same time, it's just so hilarious when you're trying to teach them some of these motor skills, something like playing like hopscotch. And to them, it's a challenge. So just, yes, you're doing something positive, but at that time, there's that joy in just no pressure from everything. And uh, this one is not too serious. So yeah. teaching them still through, play, through, through the play sessions. But then also, that being, I'm running a program as Andy Speak, where we are crowdfunding to support parents who cannot access medication, those who cannot access food. So that gives me joy, being doing that and also following with the authorities because we are more about the rights issues for special needs caregivers and their children. So especially during that time, this time, we don't have representation. So I'm just throwing myself on that on social media, organizing the hangouts that uh, Lily is talking about mm -hmm. so when parents reach out to you and you're able to help typically as a Rotarian and service to others being key to me that gives me joy it's it gives me that calm and I, I'll be on a long phone call with someone who understands yeah. and can listen but yeah, because now there's not much of physical uh, that, that's what I've been doing long conversation mm -hmm. once in a while like that glass of wine of course <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. you. Know? <laughs> I hear so. you. Now, Lily Bugade, before we let you go, please put out there a word of encouragement for those that wear your shoes, catering for those with special needs during this time and even on a daily. I uh, just want to tell the parents who are wearing a similar shoes or even feel like theirs is even a tighter shoe, there is hope we will get through this please reach out to someone who can do a lot of support for you a word shared is is uh, a burden lesson so reach out to anyone that you can and feel free to to don't feel guilty to indulge yourself uh, even though it is going out and buying yourself a chocolate just in that don't feel guilty we lots of time feel guilty when we do that because we are thinking that would have been money maybe spent on something else but a happy mom a happy parent a happy family so you need to put yourself first a bit be a bit selfish yeah. and yeah it will really go a long way to strengthen you and all these, we can beat it, and we will beat it. Mm -hmm. And so what if our children are not going to school or are not getting the therapies? God has a plan for all of us. Mm -hmm. We will get there eventually. It will be beaten, and uh, he knows what we are going through. Mm -hmm. So just reach out on that uh, a higher being that you can, that you'd want to to give yourself strength with knowing that he cares and he has your back and Amen other people are also that. empowered to support you. So yeah, reach out. Amen to that. Lily Mugane, who is a founding secretary of the T21 Families Support Organization and is a mom with a child with Down syndrome. Thank you for joining us. We wish you good health yeah. and safety during this time and all the best with Monene. Thank you very much. Truly really appreciated. Karibu sana. Now, Dr. Ari, you were very 
to you that therapy and uh, the caregiver walk hand in hand, especially in this case, would be the parents in ensuring that this patient is catered for. Do you walk with the caregivers also to help them, you know, uh, ride the tide? Oh, yes, we do. <clears throat> uh, within the hospital environment, we have a family counseling unit. Um, I can't tell you how many times we have said, you know what, this is heavy. You need somebody else once you leave the clinic, the minute you leave the clinic, somebody else needs to sit with you. And that usually does help. Occasionally, there are parents whom we've even asked the psychiatrists to intervene because it's just too much. But yes, we have a system in place and uh, we do our best. We also sit with them. Sometimes the, half the consult is not uh, about the child, it's mm. about the parent. How are you doing? How are you coping? And there's a parent who earlier mentioned that during this time, there has been so much disruption. There are medication outages. Did you know yes. that? You know Why? Mm -hmm. Because imports are not coming the way they should. Um, and sometimes we've had to change medications and that always causes anxiety. Why? Because the new medication, one, could work better. It has done that for a few children. And sometimes you find that the child doesn't work as well or doesn't cope as well with the new medication. Then, of course, there are lots of worries. We've had, we have parents who are out of work at this time. Yes. So, yes, we sit, we create time as much as possible to just talk to the parents. And once you've met them a couple of times, you can actually tell the minute they come into your office that they're having a bad day. Mm -hmm. So we first stop and talk to them. Okay. And uh, do you ever go beyond just the consultation and probably see the need there is? For example, at this time, mm -hmm. somebody does not have the money to cater for their child, but the child is really badly off. Do you have pro bono services? Yes, we do. Oh, I can't know. I can't count the number of prescriptions my team and I have dispensed. We have sent them out on WhatsApp, on email. We have done that. We have found out ways DHL can, you know, provide the money. I mean, the, the medication. Sometimes that's all they can afford at this time. Mm -hmm. So yes, phone calls. We have had phone calls with parents. We have uh, given prescriptions as appropriate. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to support them as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, problem is sometimes now you sit and think, what's the long-term plan here? Yeah. yeah, sometimes we need to be thinking beyond right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Sylvia, even as you walk with Andy Speaks, you brought up the issue that when you're talking about representation, those with special needs are left out. Education, September 1st, schools will be opening up. Have you been represented in that uh, memorandum that was given to the CS for Education? Uh, I know we had had that conversation online and there is, uh, like Crestnet had submitted a report, but because when it was launched, we don't know the content because most of the times we can pass our recommendations, but then we don't see any results over, after that. And the other challenge that you see is right now with the diversity that is education for our children. Typically, see, the first thing that was done was for atypical children, there is the, on, there is the online conversation that was put on on TV, on radio, but there was no mention of special education, all right? All we're hearing is KCD is working on something, but mm -hmm. for how long are we working on this something? Because you see now, of course, our children are regressing because we're not having intervention. We could try use online support, but I'll give you an example of one of the challenges that I'm having currently. My, my, my Bradley is both right and left-handed. All right. I, I am not an educator. I, that is one thing. I'll try the best, but I know I'm not perfect in it. But he's writing with his right hand and his left hand. So which one do I focus on? If I use a tablet, everything on there is mostly for the right-handed, like when he, I'm trying to teach him how to write the letter O. He's doing the reverse, so it's never moving. So he gets discouraged also. I get frustrated because, you see, you keep telling him, do this, do this, and you're trying to balance him. And Andrew, who's learning more through song, which distracts Bradley now because he also wants to join in this. And Andrew does not enjoy the handheld because his fine motor skills are not yet perfect. So even holding a pencil is, is a challenge. So you'll find that we are trying to be teachers, yet we are not qualified. So I'll give you an example of someone whose child is either dyslexic or something like that. That's very complicated. How do you expect a parent to now up their game, balance everything else, and also try and learn this new skill that you have zero experience on? Yeah. Sylvia, what would be the ideal situation for you? Uh, 
currently right now if we had started this earlier we have the the free computers that it's focused on typical children while special children are the ones who need it the more if we had already started on that at the right time we'd have already caught up right we need assistive devices even normally our classes are not equipped if you find also the teacher student ratio is totally off compared to the international standard for a special needs class so those are some of the things that that can be done for now at least if you have a specified um channel dedicated for special education mm -hmm. then we can be able to plug in because remember also when when i grew up i learned with something like a, a for Apple. Right now they're learning through sound, which is a uh, boo. And I'm teaching my son, my son something totally different. Or I wouldn't even know some of the letters how to relate. Or if you say Z online would be for something that does not relate here in Kenya, you know. So we need to have our own custom and that is aligned to the curriculum that the children learn in school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and even as we look at the needs of those with special needs, around 200 Israeli demonstrators protest in Jer Jerusalem to denounce the shooting of Ayad Kairi Halak, a 32-year-old disabled Palestinian by Israeli police near the Lands Gate in Jerusalem's old city, who they mistakenly thought was armed with a pistol. Israeli police in annexed East Jerusalem on Saturday shot the disabled Palestinian prompting furious condemnation from the Palestinians. The incident happened in the alleys of the walled old city near Lionsgate, an access point mainly used by Palestinians. Israeli police is annexed East Jerusalem on Saturday, shot a dead Palestinian that they mistakenly, as I said, thought was armed with a pistol. Now, Sylvia, just back to you. When we talk about the stigma that comes with either living with special needs or even caring or having a child with special needs, how does that look like? Um, first of all, most of the times we as caregivers feel the pain because you'll find our special needs children don't comprehend a lot of these emotions. But you'll see as they grow older, they actually understand. Uh, there are times where, when normal was normal, you'd go out to play and other kids don't associate your child with, with in, they don't integrate them in their play. So they, they'll end up being loners. And then you will find uh, when it comes to service, my child's disability is not something you can plainly see as a person who's on a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So if we go for service, especially in public spaces, where you know if my child stays in this line, they are claustrophobic and they can't stay here for so long and you request to get a priority and people look at you like what is wrong with you why are you cutting the line and you know it's not easy to start explaining what exactly is going on yeah. and then you you wait in line then the drama begins when the child starts getting a meltdown and people look at you like get a grip your child is misbehaving you need to so people are very judgmental they don't take time to understand that there could be something maybe you could be needing support for me most of the challenge is trying to balance andrew who's always by your side bradley who will run everywhere so you're frantically trying to balance so my eldest son um, when he's around and not in boarding, is forced to be the secondary caregiver, yeah. you know, and which forces him to grow up faster. Yeah. Uh, there is a time uh, when kids were playing and they were calling for the brother and they said, but don't come with your brothers. But now for us, if we don't bring our children to be inclusive, that means society is not going to embrace them even in the future. Yeah. If you look at the statistics, it states that they're out of every 20 ch children one has a disability why don't we take it as a lesson for everyone we have 19 children who have the opportunity to learn to embrace difference and take people as they are because no one is always the same 
-hmm. Even us as grown up, we're all different in the way we look at things, the way we process, the way we think, our character traits. Why don't we extend that empathy and ex acceptance to those who are able differently? Yeah, because okay. the parent feels the pain. You're already going through all these other things. The last thing you need is your neighbor speaking ill about your child, talking the way that your child can never amount to anything. We all wished for a normal child. It's not anyone's fault that they got a child with a disability or some challenges. And that's I what people you. need to understand. I hear you, Sylvia. And before we take a short break, Daktari, how much is the stigma that comes with special <laughs> needs a deterrent to getting the right intervention and on time? Well, it is a big problem. And sometimes it starts with self-stigmatization. Knowing, you know, people feeling... <clears throat> I am not like other people <clears throat> because now my child has this problem. I must have been a bad parent. Maybe I'm cursed. Maybe I don't deserve the help that I'm being given. Sometimes it actually starts there. Mm. And then, of course, uh, there's what Sylvia has mentioned. We have a society where their understanding of normal is just the typically developing child. So we do need to do a lot of public education and to teach people that yes, people like Karugu do deserve an opportunity mm -hmm. and they can be useful contributing members of society. Mm -hmm. Even Down syndrome children, they're usually very happy children. They're usually the people who really brighten up the clinic time or the hospital visits. Very loving. Exactly, yeah. and some of them are so musically oriented. It's such a pleasure to be with them. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason, yes, as one parent said, there's a reason why God gave us these people. Yes, as a society, we need to advocate for them, we need to provide for them, and we need to accept them as they are. Okay, so as a society, are we cognizant of the fact that there are rare diseases out there and the people live in this reality and are we catering for their needs, especially at this time? We answer that question right after the short break. Amar Sanitizer is an alcohol-based sanitizer containing ethanol which has a broad spectrum antimicrobial activity killing bacteria, viruses and fungi. Amar Sanitizer is enriched with aloe vera making it gentle on your hands. It is your world. My name is Gladys Gashanja. Thank you for watching. Even as we talk about the disruption of COVID-19 on those with special needs and the caregivers. And uh, I still have Dr. Pauline Samir with me in studio. And uh, Dr. Tari, even looking at those that have rare diseases, they are called rare because you rarely hear of them, but they do exist. Give us an idea of what exactly entails rare diseases. Um, well, the definition of rare diseases is anything that affects less than one in a thousand population, uh, according to, I think, uh, one of the definitions given in the EU. Um, so rare diseases are things that you will 
as you say, <laughs> rarely encounter them, but it's not to say that they don't exist. So there are very many of them. And uh, for us, uh, because we're a referral unit, yes, we, they're not really that rare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, uh, for example, I know there's a parent coming on with, uh, a, with a child with a problem called Jubei syndrome. I have seen at least three in my time uh, practicing uh, at Aga Khan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they are rare because they don't, okay, I mean, uh, 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 occur very frequently in the population, but together they are a significant number. Okay, and you talked about Jobert. Tell us what exactly is it? What does it entail? What does it affect? All right, so Jobert syndrome is a malformation of the brain where the brain is um, unusual in the sense that uh, the area that contains the centers that control breathing, the heart, you know, control of the heartbeat, mm -hmm. you know, the midbrain, it's, it's, it's much smaller, it's much thinner. The area just don't, doesn't develop as well as it should. And if you know to look out for it when you do an MRI scan, then you see a certain uh, picture, which we call a molar tooth appearance. But basically what we're saying is that that part of the brain, which is really central to your existence, to your functioning, is uh, um, does not develop the way it should. Mm -hmm. The other thing sometimes we see in some of them is that they will also get seizure problems. Uh, they will have uh, problems with uh, intellect and uh, cognition. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like a spectrum. There's some who are very severely affected. Uh, I have a girl who's much older, around 15, 16 years of age uh, now, and she's not doing that badly. And we have another one who's really struggling to even gain milestones while, you know, while still very young. So it is, again, a spectrum, but the basic, um, uh, and of course, there are genetic factors to it. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, there are very many genes that can lead to that problem, but basically it, it's what we call a developmental issue. You're born with it. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, we're now joined by Rosaline Kanja, who has a son with the Jobert syndrome and also mm -hmm. has another son who is dyslexic. Uh, Rose, when did you find out your son had uh, Jobert? Um, so, hi Gladys, hey. great, great to hear, great to be here. So, we found out around eight months there's a problem uh, with the brain. So, we were given one diagnosis at the time, and then when the baby was born, and it looked like something was a bit off, we were asked to do a brain MRI, and that's when they caught it, at, that's Javert syndrome. Oh, that was pretty early enough. So for somebody who doesn't have a keen yeah. eye, what normally are the symptoms, apart from what Daktari has touched on, the seizures and all? So uh, I remember when the, uh, he was about two, three days old, I noticed that his breathing was a bit, a bit different. So with Jobert syndrome, you have children having irregular breathing. So that I noticed. And then I remember the doctor said, um, no, nothing to worry about. And then, then we went into ICU for other issues. And then with time, of course, there's the delayed milestones. Uh, for him, he was affected. His kidney, one kidney doesn't work. It has cysts in it. So children are affected differently. There are those who have heart problems. There are those who have liver problems and other body systems. So for him, he one kidney doesn't work. He has delayed um Milestones, uh, we have irregular eye movements, so we've had to intervene as in he, he now wears glasses. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of sometimes on, in and out of hospitals, especially because of chest infections for one thing or the other, because he doesn't, he's not, because of his low muscle tone, he can't quite cough it up. So you find that just a common cold takes him about two months to just clear. Okay, and how old is he? He's now three and a half. Okay, well done. And uh, how is coping with his condition at a time like this, considering that COVID-19 has similar symptoms to a very bad flu? Well, it's, it was, at the beginning, it was very, uh, you're anxious constantly. But this is the funniest thing, this whole thing of keeping away from the crowds, con constantly sanitizing your hands and everything. We're a bit familiar to that because that's one of the ways we're able to keep him away from getting colds and other infections. But for now, there's a lot of anxiety because he's among the bracket with people with uh, other, as they call comorbidities or other underlying conditions. Yeah. So together with a brother who's also asthmatic. So that means even going to hospitals and you find that even for other parents with a rare uh, child, you're always constantly afraid of going to 
the, the hospital, even when you probably need to because you're thinking that you'll go and pick it up there or on your way there. So a bit more locked in, uh, restricted movements, just to try and keep everyone safe. And uh, how are you? Oh, yeah, and then... Th mm -hmm. Sorry, and one more. And then, of course, therapies, you have to stop yeah. uh, because of the risk involved in having to go there and all. And so how are you accessing uh, medication treatment for him? So right now we're at a bit of a better, very good place where we don't need a lot of medications. Mm -hmm. So we, we are just surviving on laxatives and a lot of um, food changes because he has also... Uh, allergies to food or they affect him in one way or another mm -hmm. uh, he has gastro issues so um that's kind of how we are coping at the moment okay so not so many drugs not so many drugs for now all right now you mentioned his brother has asthma and he's also dyslexic how is that yes that now that's where our main challenge right now is uh, in the sense that because he also is hyperactive so you find that online learning doesn't really suit children with dyslexic. They need a multisensory approach where apart from just seeing, you are touching, it's, it's a bit different from them. So he does, he, his attention span from just sitting and listening to an, to an audio, like for the ones for the radio or on TV, it's hard for him. It, it doesn't quite easily translate to understanding and putting it down. Mm -hmm. So you're having to step in as a teacher also and of course, and a lot of parents at this point, you're not equipped. Uh, teaching a dyslexic child is not the same as teaching a typical child. And then his attention span. So of course, with the one that he doesn't want to to read, or why do you have to be my teacher? And it's it's a bit intense. So we try as much as possible to allow him to, for him specifically, to keep giving him breaks to go out and in. So for him, that has caused a bit of disruption for him and he's he's trying to cope with it okay and being cooped up in a small space i mean if he has all this pent-up energy how are you handling that oh wow so the good thing for us just before covid hit we adopted a stray cat so that was god sent so yeah. their buddies it keeps him busy so okay. in a way that has helped because he can't play with his brother like if it was any other typical family they would be running around and playing together. So it's, so we've been able to keep him indoors with that, um, trying to look for creative things to do in the house. Sometimes it's just like um, uh, things on, on online learning, mm -hmm. uh, but I think around this point we let him go a bit outside more so that if he gets to release that energy. Then we come back and try and see what we can do. So learning for him, you see 10 minutes, then you go, uh -huh. then another like five minutes. So that, that's, that's tough. Okay. Now, I'll, uh, when we come back, I'd like to find out how you're handling this as a caregiver. But across the, the borders, mm -hmm. children with hands bound together and tied to a radiator, some in tears, harrowing photos from inside an institution for the, those that are disabled, especially the youth, have shocked Bosnia and shed light on the lack of support for special needs kids and their families. The photos from the public institution outside Sarajevo were fast revealed by an opposition lawmaker in November, triggering street protests and outrage over the inhumane treatment. Now, a probe is underway and the director of the home has been dismissed by some 3,000 other minors leaving such institutions isolated from society and often in grim conditions, according to the NGO Sumero, which helps youth with disabilities. These centers are a last resort for parents who are left to fend for themselves in one of Europe's poorest countries where the most help they can hope for is a monthly state allowance. Now, uh, Kulelija, a 41-year-old supermarket employee in Sarajevo, is well acquainted with the difficult choices such as families face, such as these families face, and his brother has a mental disability and has spent 20 years living in the center under investigation. Dr. Samir, Roslyn Kanja has a son who's dyslexic. It is, um, yeah, actually define what it is before I say what it is and exactly how it is a disability. 
All right. Um, children who have dyslexia have learning problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have uh, difficulties in understanding the written word. Some of them are very good, uh, vi I mean, uh, visual learners. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when you put out pictures, when you explain this is an apple using a picture, when they touch an apple, but then just translating or understanding the written word for them is a bit of a problem. Uh, it is a problem. And therefore, they take much longer. They need sometimes even twice as much time to just learn the same concepts as children because the way we, the media or the mediums that we have been using for teaching generally is the printed word or what is written on the blackboard. So for them to read and then translate that in their brains into something meaningful can sometimes be a problem. So some of them are better at uh, audio learning, you know, like for instance, they are happy to listen to a book that is being read and they will understand and they will tell you the story. Yeah, yeah so you have to have a creative approach to teaching uh, a child with dyslexia to enhance their learning. So it is an intellectual disability. To some extent, yes. This, this child externally, he'll be fine. He'll mm -hmm. be happy. He will be able to hold conversations with you. But when it comes to reading, then you have a challenge. Any indication as to why one child would have it and another wouldn't? Sometimes it's just a way the genet you know, it's a, once again, it goes back to genetics, how your brain is created and how the connections are able to mature according to your chronological age. For most of them, they eventually become, uh, they, they eventually gain the ability to read, to write, but it takes them so much longer. You know, like you can be 10 years old and the kind of books you're happy to read are those of children who are much younger. Why we never give up on such kids is because we know as their brains continue to mature, that ability does improve. Yeah. But in, during the foundation years, they need parents who understand them. They also need uh, teachers who are able to bridge the gap and re uh, reach their needs. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, Rosalind, at least the boy is grown now and you say he's coping much better than he did when he was young. How are you coping at this time being a caregiver to these children? Well, um, it's tough because you have to sort of, you feel like you're constantly learning new skills, like not trying to be his teacher. Uh, at the same time, uh, give attention to Morgan who has, um, right now, his medical attention is not that high. Uh, so we also have to teach him. So you, you become a teacher. Then of course, it's there's the financial insecurity because now there's no work and uh, it affects your income which still affects how you pay for therapies and medical um, attention for, for these children. So it's a bit stressful. There's a lot of anxiety. Um, you have to constantly make a decision. Do I need to go out? Do I need to do this or that? So it is challenging, but um, you still grow in with the help for others, like mm -hmm. a support system. You still call teachers if you have to. You write to people and you try as much as possible to just get by. Mm -hmm. Try and still have fun moments despite everything that's going on. Now, you are part of a bigger community of uh, the rare disease Kenya, of parents who have children with yes. rare diseases. What is the indication of how yes. they're coping at this time? Well, it's tough, very tough for them. Well, you see, like some, some need constant medication and some of them are very specific medications and they're very expensive. So you find with everything that's happening, they're not able to access or get their medication. So of course, this has an effect on their health. <clears throat> you need these medications to get by. Some have had to have lost their jobs. So of course, there's that uh, wondering what next, what happens to you? And you still have to either take care of a child or even take care of yourself. Of course, there's anxiety. Um, they still need to go to doctors and, mm -hmm. and still follow up. Uh, reviews and all that but now because you're constantly scared of going to hospital then you delay it as much as possible which is on the other hand still affects you um, so there's a lot and, and you see for the rare disease community people are affected differently there are those who are constant medication there are those who they need therapies and then there are those who um, there's no drug you have to get by so so those are the challenges there's a lot of anxiety so a lot of people are just simply staying home trying to you know protect themselves so but at the same time sometimes you have to go outside and work or get money so it's it's really a trying time for people in the rare community
Okay, we hear you, Rose. And uh, across the borders, everyone is trying to cope with what they have to deal with. And with the staying at home regulations taking yeah. a toll on people, they are willing to go beyond borders to ensure they can have some sort of social interaction. Here's what a COVID-19 social distancing party would look like. <laughs> It clearly is the hashtag new normal. Now the Japan Air Self-Defense Forces Blue Impulse Team was with aerial acrobatics over downtown Tokyo to thank healthcare workers. These Top Gun kid of salutes and celebrations to medical workers and other frontline workers have been both praised and criticized for being overly expensive, unnecessary and an inefficient way to use financial resources. Elsewhere, we're really at the end of our rope, says Marie-Claire Crenette, a camper van driver from the south of France who has been stranded for two months in Mohamedia, Morocco, because of the coronavirus pandemic. Marie and other camper van owners from the south of France arrived in Mohamedia on the 15th of March after spending the holidays there and were to take a ferry to return home. Despite registering with the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs website on March the 23rd, the camper Super van drivers are still confined in Morocco. Là, nous avons fini. C'est le compteur électrique, je pense. Et nous avons notre plaque chauffante, notre four. If you're just joining us, let's refresh your mind. Did you know that over a billion people live with some sort of disability? Well, this corresponds to about 50% of the world's population. Between 110 to 190 million adults have very significant difficulties in functioning. Rates of disability are increasing due to population aging and the global increase in chronic health conditions. Now, did you also know that children with special needs tend to excel at math? Yes, autistic kids with an average IQ generally have better math skills than non-autistic kids with the same IQ. Research shows that autistic kids used complex mathematical strategies when problem solving as opposed to counting on their fingers or with a pen and paper. It's simply brilliant. Did you know that people with disabilities also are vulnerable to poverty? Well, they have worse living conditions, including insufficient food, poor housing, lack of access to safe water and sanitation than non-disabled people. Now, at the end of the day, we choose to see if uh, it's not as, as a disorder, but as a unique way of seeing the world. We choose to see them as the rest of us, just a little bit different. All right. Now, even as we talk about the special uh, skills that those with special needs have, Sylvia, is this something you've seen in your sons? Yes, that is that is very true. Because uh, all the while, when Andrew was not speaking, he he pays attention to his environment. But the day he started talking, when he was around five, five and a half, he could hum and mime all the songs in the CDs of my vehicle, which was very um, shocking because one minute you are not talking, the next you can sing any song. He knows more songs than I do, although have, when he wants to listen to a specific song, because of the lack of clarity on how he would say it, I would have to consult with either the brother or the nanny, then we think, what exactly is he trying to say? But if you get it right, because he'll go through and visually he can remember, and he knows all TV stations by their logos. So if we're, walk, if we're driving down, he'll tell you that's Mpesa. So he goes naming everything. So don't assume just because a child is not talking, they're not understanding. When it comes to Bradley, he's sort of the genius in the house. 
Because anything mechanical, he'll watch you do once, he will repeat it. We go down a road, let's say, to visit a friend, he will remember. The minute you start on that road, he'll tell you, we are going to grandma, we are going to our friend X, Y, Z. And he'll tell you, that's where so-and-so used to live. So he does not forget mm -hmm. that that's one thing that's quite awesome. Amazing. Yeah. Now, Rosaline, even as we wrap up this conversation, what would be your clarion call to those that are tasked to actually watch over us in as far as this pandemic is concerned? Well, to first of all acknowledge that um, all this is happening, uh, that people in the special needs um, area have quite a lot of challenges that are not typical to other people. Um, for us, especially in the rare uh, disease fraternity, you have people who are missing really important medicines that are even, not even there in the hospitals themselves. Yeah. So if we can be able to somehow help avail those medicines in one way or another, and maybe even subsidize uh, th these medicines or even treatments, because I'm thinking of people beyond the urban sector. So we have yeah. a lot of people who are not able to pay even for the, the littlest medicine that you need. That and also when they're coming up with um, policies here and there to also remember that, especially I know even for the autism, autism uh, group, these children are having meltdowns and I'll, this just change of routine affects them. Yes. So we need to find other ways that we can allow students to still within safe uh, confinement that we can still be able to get up on the knees, like be able to still go outside and maybe even like as we now we are exploring about home care and all that yeah we need to still have that discussion with the people with special needs in mind thank you and dr sami even as we talk about telemedicine and catering for those with special needs your parting shot oh well these are trying times and uh, unfortunately the way it looks is that uh, covid is here to stay mm -hmm. so basically it looks like uh, we need to radically change uh, some of the things that we do because you sit and think about it um, especially so for the younger children if we do not allow them or facilitate their therapies what happens it just means that um, uh, when we introduce this maybe two or three years down the line, mm -hmm. they're likely to be less effective. Mm -hmm. So when uh, people's economic status changes, then you must therefore write effective medications that probably uh, cost less. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I think we, we do need to change things, even within uh, the physical space, like within the yeah. clinics. Like I know at uh, Aga Khan, we've had to really spread out all our clinics. Not all children are seen, seen on site, uh -huh. like the ones who are needing vaccinations, that's all done off site. All the young babies who are just coming for checkups because they're two weeks old, they're six weeks old, those are also seen off site. So we have to change our systems. It's expensive, it yeah. was not warranted, some things are not even budgeted for, but we must do what we must do to be able to deliver healthcare in an appropriate way. Dr. Pauline Samir, who is a pediatric neurologist from the Aga Khan University Hospital, Sylvia Mora, who is the founder of Andy Speaks and a mother to two children with special needs, Rosalind Kanja, who has two children with special needs and also a founding member of Rare Disease Kenya. And early on, we had been joined by Lily Mogane, who is a caregiver to a child with Down syndrome and a founding secretary for the T21 Family Support Organization. And of course, we had Kamoyo Karongo, who is a cerebral palsy advocate living with CP, but he is such an inspiration. Everybody, thank you for joining me on this vital conversation. Tomorrow, we take on another vital conversation, and this one has a lot to do with the second chances that this period has given all of us. We are looking at it as a reset button. So, can we rise from the ashes? Yes, we can, because there are stories of those who actually have done so, and we'll be listening to some of them tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. My name is Gladys Geshenja. Have a good day.